All right, time for another episode. Here we go. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to episode number 21 of the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast. My name is Jim, and joining me as always, renowned hitting instructor, professional evaluator, my former coach, friend, and co-host, uh, live and in living color, as they say, Jake Epstein. Hello, Jake. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, good morning to you. I'm doing well. Getting ready for a big day. Big Saturday. Got a lot of. Uh, I guess we're filming on or recording on a Saturday, but I'm excited to have a, have actually a couple of new players um, coming in to train today. So Very it's always good. exciting to meet new people and see what their swings will bring us. I wonder if those players have listened to the podcast and have signed up because they've listened to the podcast. Uh, I I don't know, but I did have a new member start a couple days ago. Um, pretty good player and. They're from um, somewhat local here in Texas. And, uh, yeah, the podcast was like, wow, this, this guy knows what he's talking about. There you go. Let's sign my kid up and start trading. So, That's absolutely, it's it's uh, it's happening. That's the point of the uh, – part of the point of the podcast. This guy knows what he's talking about, and let's let's sign up. There's let's so many training. people that don't. There's I so know. many people that hang a shingle and, you know, give lessons. And, you know, it's not their – you know, when when something is your your full time job and your name is on the business, you take a lot of pride in what you do. Agree. And yeah. yeah, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people they're just coaches and they're trying to make a few bucks here and there. You know, some extra extra scratch. <laughs> um, but that's not what we do. Like we're we're truly invested in in our players because the better our players do, the better our reputation is, mm-hmm. and uh, we can feed our families. Yeah, and <laughs> and some people do it for extra scratch, extra betting money. You know, <laughs> yeah, betting's everywhere now, so whatever yeah, the might case. as well. Whatever the case. By the way, the show—not to bore everybody here—but the show is now on in seven different countries. So we're growing around the world. Man, I'm gonna have to learn some new languages. Yeah, I already know Spanish. I don't know about you, but yeah, uh, I don't think we're on actually in any Spanish countries. Believe it or not. Huh. So. Well, I guess my, my... That's because we're not doing it in Spanish. No, you're you're exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we are on in seven Russia. We're on in Russia. Somebody's listening in Russia, so we appreciate that. Yeah, I don't know how big baseball is in Russia, but it might be growing a new audience. I know. Uh, I, I'm my. I have Russian heritage, so you know okay. maybe it's a long lost ancestor. Um, however, the hit tracks. The new hit tracks update has the Moscow baseball field in it. Which right. we use all the time because it's fun. It's in meters, and the gaps are really short. So the kids love to do home run derby on the Moscow field. And uh, so the kids are how old? Because I'm thinking I'm picturing like a little league field here. Yeah, it's it's not much bigger than that. Hit tracks will make it as big as you want, but yeah, I would say it would be similar to a summer ball collegiate summer ball field is is kind of what it reminds me of are we talking cape cod league or are we are we talking um the nor- uh, what's the other good league in the northeast uh, we're near massachusetts uh, yeah any cbl or something like that um could be yeah. yeah no i'm talking yeah your your small town Stadium. So I played in the uh, the Jayhawk League mm-hmm. uh, out in Missouri, Kansas area, Iowa, or I guess that would have been the Mink League. But I was in the Jayhawk League, and then I was in the Valley League, which is a really good league in Virginia. Um, it runs all through what is that I ninety five corridor. Mm-hmm. So you know, kind of small town. That's what it gives you the feel of small town. You know, we said on a previous episode that that the summer leagues are used for. Unless it's the Cape Cod, for off season, um, sort of tinkering and maybe taking a step back a little bit, but still getting your reps in, getting your work in. Um, some of those leagues, though, the Jayhawk League, the Coastal Plains League, another one, the Valley mm-hmm. League that you mentioned, the NECBL, those leagues uh, are are very good and, and I would think very competitive. So, how much tinkering really is there going on in those leagues? There is, you know, it depends what league you're coming from. You know, if you're coming from, because you know those those teams have players from from all over. You know, I mean, you might have a couple SEC guys in it. You might have some Big Twelve guys in it. You might have some, you know, random Pac twelve, and then you're going to have junior college players. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to have some, um, you know, 
Division One schools, maybe not not as highly ranked or you know subdivision kind of schools. So you're not facing, you know, if you're an SEC guy and you, you know, not everybody goes to the Cape, right? You you go somewhere else, Northwoods League, for instance. You're, you know, you're not going to face SEC caliber pitching every day, and so it's a big weight off your shoulders. Like, oh, I can relax a little bit. I'm not going to face 95 today, you yeah. know, as the starter, and then 97, the guy's coming out of the pen. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, it, it's definitely a. I wouldn't say you know necessarily a step down in, in total competition, but it's it's a relief. You're getting away from the big stadiums. You're getting away from your coaching staff that you know is probably putting pressure on you to to perform. Yeah. And you know a lot of guys, a lot of guys thrive. I know one of the kids at Mizzou went out this summer. Um, he's a really talented kid, two way guy. I think he was the Gatorade Player of the Year actually in, in uh, Missouri. He can pitch. He's just a competitor. Yeah. And you know he went out and just totally dominated in the summer because, you know, it was just a little less pressure. He's a young kid. He's only a sophomore, you know, and he ended up being like player of the league. And that's, that's kind of what you get, you know, when you get out. And I, re- I remember doing this like, oh, I'm just getting away from, you know, you're, you're on campus for so long and you're with the same people all the time and you see the same coaches all the time and you're working out every single day. And yeah. sometimes it's a breath of fresh air to just kind of get away from that and be in a new environment. I think that's why some players really succeed, you know, in summer ball. And whether they're working on things or not, they're they're just getting at bats. Yeah. You know, there's nobody sitting there telling them, hey, you got to do this and that pressure of that kid. If he goes over four, you know, he's probably not going to, you know, be sad right he's going to go to sonic at the end of the night have a slushy and dinner and then he's going to wake up the next day and try to get a couple hits yeah or go to a bar and pick up a girl <laughs> right <laughs> well, depends how old he is yeah 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 it's true too it's true. <laughs> i guess I'm, yeah yeah, that's true too. By the way, um, one quick note before now we I know what you did. Now I know what you did at Summer Ball, Jim. Now it to- totally makes sense. I did not go to the bar though, but it was hard <laughs> back then. It's easy in today's world. Well, the um, the dating what are they called? Dating app. All the dating apps, and it's easy now. I would think for players to <laughs> you know meet different women throughout wherever they're playing. You just got to swipe left or right. Right, that's what it is. Right. There you go. There you go. Um, really, one quick note, by the way, uh, before we get into uh, today's episode. This is a name you might be hearing of in the future. Um, ep. It's uh, Alejandro Kirk. He was just called up for uh, with us today, the, or yesterday, excuse me, with uh, the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, he was uh, with us at the advanced aid level last year. He was tremendous. Tremendous hitter. Uh, he had the best walk-up song that one could ever, ever hear. It was so catchy, and it will catch on very quickly. Um, but he's also an, an excellent hitter. So, congrats to Alejandro Kirk. But everybody will should will his walk up song will go viral. It's very very catchy. I forget what it's called, so you can't YouTube it. Sorry about that. But oh, really? It is very catchy. I don't. Even, you mean you can't even throw a name out? We could do an episode on walk up songs. We could really. I, we could do that. I, I think we should get all of our listeners to send in their favorite walk up songs. I think it would be fun to have like a total list of. You know, uh, maybe an Instagram post or something with yeah. you know the greatest walk-up songs. I was uh, we had at Mizzou. I'll never forget uh, Art Hoven, who's our left-handed pitcher. Art weighs like 152 pound. You know, he's like six <laughs> one. <laughs> and Fat Bottom Girls was his his Fat song bottom, yeah. when he, he took the mound. I thought that was pretty pretty. Uh, now whether or not he orchestrated that or our baseball ops guy orchestrated it is to be to be known nobody truly knows where the song came what was from. your walk-up I, song when you were playing uh all along the watchtower by Jimi hendrix okay so you were i was a Jimmy huge ken caminiti fan and that's what Kem- caminiti came out to when i was a kid in san diego and it just kind of rocked you know the old uh qualcomm stadium yeah when he would come and he was such a bad dude that i always wanted that song so when i had the opportunity that's what i did not as good as hell's hell's bells when Trevor Hoffman would start coming out of the bullpen in the ninth inning. That was the coolest part of like any Padre game. You would just hear the bells ringing, you know, after the third out and the half top half of the inning. You'd hear the bells ringing, and the place would just go nuts. So, whose walkout song was better then? Comparing closers here, you know where I'm probably going with this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Trevor Hoffman Rivera, or Mariano Sandman. Rivera. Was it Enter Sandman? Is that what it yes. came out to? Yes. Yeah, I got to go Hoffman. Okay. 
I gotta go. Is that a bias? Just because opinion, though? I didn't. Ex- yeah, totally. Right. And it's because I didn't okay. experience, you know, uh, Enter Sandman. Okay. And I met Hoffman at the beach one day when I was like fourteen. That was wow. Okay. How was that, that was cool. He was just hanging out with his family. It was like the one-off day. He was at Del Mar Beach. Okay. Nice guy. Very good. Yeah. So Alejandro Kirk, I would uh, search up. Yeah, I'll have to song. keep an eye out for that. When he made, he's supposed to make his debut today. We're recording this, by the way, everybody, on a Saturday. I may miss his debut because there's a lot of college football on today. So, <laughs> and you, so yeah, there you go. We listen to the lab, and um, while you're watching college football, we'd really appreciate it. Yeah. Next week, uh, his teammate, now teammate, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. will be the feature of our Mechanical Breakdown series. Uh, that'll be, what, the third Mechanical Breakdown series. We did Torkelson. We did Bryce Harper. That's it. Yeah, so that'll be number three next mm-hmm. week, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., your guy. You love his Big story. fan. Mm-hmm. I do. Yeah. That'll be next week. All right, well, we stalled here long enough. Let's get into uh, today's topic, uh, episode 21, Robotic Strike Zones and the possibility that they come into play here at the major league level in the next couple of years. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. New episodes every Monday, of course, 9 a.m. Follow us on social media at Epstein Hitting, uh, at Jim Tara. I would give out my dog's Instagram. My sister made my dog an Instagram, but I... I of course she uh, did. I, I don't think I, could, I should do that. I already gave out her Instagram on my on Twitter. I'm afraid she's going to have more Instagram followers by the end of the week than me, so I can't run that risk. Uh, and you can also email us your questions or your walk-up songs at jimbopodcast21 at, uh, at gmail.com. All right, so let's get into today's topic, uh, Robo Strike Zones. And we're kind of going to do a top-heavy show today, and I'm going to ask your opinion of the possibility of Robo Strike Zones of the future right off the bat. You've alluded to it in a previous episode, but I want to get more of a diagram of your opinion here, of what you think of the possibility of robo strike zones coming into play at the major league level in the near future, or in the, I don't know, distant future, whenever they do actually come into play. I would think it would be closer to near future rather than the distant future, but nevertheless. I think there's bugs, you know, like anything else that's new. Um, just from what I saw in the, the Arizona Fall League last year, was that 2019? Mm-hmm. They, they debuted it or they tried it. Uh, and it was, you know, where there was a tone that, you know, showed up in the the home. There was a home plate umpire, and he's he's sitting behind home plate, and he's mm-hmm. watching the action, right? Because yeah. there's plays at the plate, you got to have a home plate umpire. Um, you know, foul balls, you know, foul tips, things like that. The the robo generator, you know, probably isn't gonna gonna get a feel of. So, you know, I think it's it's important to have someone there. Um, and there were balls that were really low. That was like kind of the issue that the robo strike zone was dealing with was if it caught the front of the of home plate mm-hmm. on yeah. the way down, and even if it was like a breaking ball with a steep descending angle, you know, it clipped the very bottom by, you know, maybe a couple millimeters, and then it almost bounced, right? That was the issue that some of the players, you know, were having. So there, there's obviously ways to adjust that. Look, we have... We have instant replay. You know, this essentially is instant, instant replay, right? Okay. We don't have, you know, and, and it goes back, you know, instant replay really goes back to the um, Gosh, I can see. I remember there was a play at first base. Joyce called the guy safe. He was out. I think it was the last out of mm-hmm. the perfect game. Um, right, and Joyce felt terrible about it. 2010, I, mean, was, I think it was. Is that what it was? Yeah, it and, was, and yeah. Joyce. I mean, he's crying at home plate the next day when the pitcher comes out to bring the lineup out, and he forgave him and all that. But you could have bailed Jim Joyce out there. Yeah. You know, like you you bailed him out. If that happens today, it's a non-issue, right? Like, oh, oh, he was really out. And why not do that with the strike zone? You know, I, I know there's the the umpires or this and that and. I'll tell you what, um, umpires are getting fooled. Umpires are getting fooled badly with this this catching technique, which is, I wouldn't call it framing. They're just continually moving the ball, so the umpire really isn't seeing where they're catching it. Yeah. Right? So the umpires now, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more work for them. I, I, I don't think I've seen more pitches missed than I have this year. Like, no doubt about it. I'm seeing pitches that are missed constantly 
because of you know this the new technique i'm not gonna say it's good or bad it as as a fan it looks terrible Mm -hmm. as a former catcher it looks terrible as a front office uh or coach or pitcher i'm thinking it looks great because i'm stealing strikes right and that's cool like i I understand the game but it's it's hard for me to watch that um because it's not clean and, and i like watching a clean catcher back there not somebody that's you know moving all over the place so um I think it it's it's going to make the game, you know, for hitters and pitchers. I mean, you got guys that have strike zones that are really really small too. So, you're going to have pitchers that maybe get the pitch up a little bit more, right? What they're not going to do is they're not going to get the pitch that's 4 inches running off the plate. Mm-hmm. That, and and that's what I think I think we can create a consistency, you know, we train our players, we use you know, like for instance, we use the the Win Reality, vir- you know, VR system at, at the lab, right? And what is that? Well, that's it tells you you're learning the strike zone, right? You're learning the strike zone as it is. You know, 17 inches wide, and then you know, however, you know, high, the the height differential based on how tall you are, right? So we're learning that strike zone, and if a pitch is you know one inch off the plate and you swing at it, that virtual reality tells you that hey, that was a ball. Yeah. But in reality, if we swing at that pitch, that may have been a strike. So we have the technology to do that. Look, let's learn the strikes, and it's going to make hitters, I believe, a little bit more. Um, they're going to be able to control the zone because they're going to know what the zone is. And and we all know there's bad umpires out there. I mean, there's – I shouldn't say bad umpires. I, listen, no, I don't want to be an umpire. <laughs> that, that, that's hard. Like, that is a hard, hard job, and you have to – have an edge to you if you're going to be an umpire right because you're just going to you know you're going to get it left and right you know what if there's a a strike zone and you don't have to be that guy people gonna love you now like they're not going to yell at you all the time they're not going to argue at you all the time all you're doing is hey man this is what the computer said yeah it said it was in the strike zone i'm calling it a strike it's out of the strikes i'm calling a ball what are you going to argue that and i think you know the more we watch you know, games from center field, you know, and we see the strike zone in there and, you know, the ball misses the strike zone and the guy calls a strike and we're like, gosh, that, you know, look how easy that is. I can see the box right there. Why can't I, you know, why can't the umpire see it? And I think we can make that a case where, hey, the umpire can, you know, have that virtual strike zone that's in there. We have the technology to do it. Let's just make the game move forward the way that, you know, it has with instant replay and anything else. You made a good point there when you were talking about what you guys use at the lab, learning the strike zone. I think people would be less apprehensive for the robo zone coming into play if they knew and the strike zone was actually defined and it wasn't all over the place as it was in the Arizona Fall League. Because truth be told, there were pitches that were called that were in the dirt that were called Mm -hmm. strikes. And you can't really tell an umpire to go back on the robo zone if it's really a ball but it was called a strike because that defeats the purpose just like it defeats the purpose if the robo zone has different strike zones every single night well you might as well just go back to the the human element so that's the biggest key though i think in all of this is the the robo zone having that one zone that everybody knows pitchers and catchers and hitters managers hitting coaches pitching coaches everybody on the field so now it makes the game cleaner rather than having it be all over the place as it was in the Arizona Fall League. Yeah, it's it, it, it is. It's technology, so it has to be it has to be correct. And then when do you and then how much is that? What is the cost associated with that? Right. And then when do you start it? Do you start it in AAA? Do you start it in AA? Do you start it in A ball? You start it in college? I mean, Lord knows that twelve year old softball that that I watch. You know that strike zone's got to be the size of the batter's box, right? Like yeah. kids don't throw very many strikes. Well, so I do have you know, a question. You, yeah, you, I do have you a, implement that. I do have a question about that. I'm going to ask it later on in the show. Yeah, um, it is. For the record, it is currently was supposed to be implemented this year at the lower levels of the minor leagues. I don't know about college, but it was the TrackMan system was implemented. It was installed in a lot of minor league ballparks at the lower levels. So that's why yeah. I say they're fast tracking this thing. But do we really know what that strike zone will be? And I, again, I don't like the idea of using the minor leagues and affiliated ball as the guinea pig for these things, for these rules. I don't like the idea. I didn't like the idea of, of using the runner at second, starting the runner at second base in extra innings. 
at the minor at, at the minor league level. I didn't like it because here we are now in unforeseen circumstances, and we've got a guy who I mentioned earlier in the show, Alejandro Kirk, who's at the advanced day level last year. He's about to make his major league debut today on a Saturday, September twelfth, two thousand and twenty. Again, a year ago, he was in advanced day. He should have been in double A. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't like how my point is. I don't like how right away this system was supposed to be implemented and oh well we're going to implement it at the minor league level and let all the bugs let all the the, the kinks out there well we're trying to develop players uh, so i don't i don't like that idea so if we're going to have this thing we have to have clean technology at all levels and i think if they have the um you know, if they had a screen, like at the major league level, you know how they show the replay on, on MLB Network or ESPN, you know, where it's like a three-dimensional strike zone yeah. and it shows the ball and it, what yeah. part of the strike zone it catches. Mm-hmm. I think if they have that graphic on the scoreboard somewhere mm-hmm. or somewhere, you know, on the Megatron or whatever, they don't call them Megatrons anymore. Um, you Date know, yourself. I think that... What's that? You're dating yourself. I know the dot matrix. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think if they have that graphic up there for the technology, it makes sense. But you're right about the trackman. If that trackman's off a couple degrees, if it gets hit, right, a foul ball hits yeah. it, you know, maybe it knocks it a couple centimeters. Yeah. Oh my lord! You know, now all of a sudden we got all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, I'm I'm looking at like I don't know how tennis does it. Right, tennis has that really cool. Um, Hawkeye system, which I thought Hawkeye was coming into Major League Baseball. I thought Trackman was out, if I'm not mistaken, and they were going to use something different this year. Maybe for, I, for, I don't. I didn't hear about that. That could possibly be the case. It though. was for the you know the Statcast, like it was a different technology okay. they were going to use. Okay, maybe and I don't, sure. obviously that never happened. But you know, regardless, there's technologies out there that are whatever can create a web yeah. in there that I, I think could be useful. Um, you know, it's the purest, you know, the purest. Is it going to take more time, you know, getting that information to the umpire? Um, what if the umpire doesn't even call the pitch? What if it just shows up on the scoreboard, right? What if it's right. that instantaneous, right? It just pops up, boom, strike, mm-hmm. ball, you know, and they show the graphic of, of where it was in the strike zone. I, I think it could be, well, the umpire it could be usable. Been, I think the umpire has a um, uh, IFB, if I'm not mistaken, that censors them to call the strike. But there's they a do, slight but delay. It, there is a delay of a couple seconds. So that's what you have. It's like there's that two-second, three-second delay, and the ball was low in the dirt, and all of a sudden he rings the guy up yeah. when the guy thought it was a ball and, and so on and so forth. But I think it just brings consistency to, to the game. If it if it helps the game, great. You know, maybe it doesn't. Maybe I'm just kind of, you know, blowing smoke. But I, I think that – I think it makes for a cleaner – baseball game unless you want to sit there and ride the umpire all game i mean <laughs> most people don't know what it's like to be in a dugout yeah you know in a, in a stressful game and a very important game a high intensity game that means a lot and you're relying on that guy back there who i mean pitchers have really good stuff now right and he's not seeing this guy's late movement or you know, he's not picking up, and so pitches are off the plate. The catcher's setting up four inches off the plate, but he's doing a really good job with it. Mm-hmm. And your hitters are sitting there, and they're like, God, I can't, I can't get to that pitch, right? And then what do you do? You start barking at the umpire, right? Why do you start barking? Because you can go and watch the replay of the game, mm-hmm. you know, in the clubhouse and be like, God, these pitches are four inches off the plate, man. How do you expect us to hit it? Yeah. And then, you know, everybody gets pissed off, and then he's chirping back and forth. So, I think if you can alleviate that part of the game, okay. then um, that would be beneficial. Okay. I mean, I got unfortunately I got our pitching coach run a couple of, when I we were in Georgia, so I feel real bad about that, Fred. You know, I feel bad about that. But <laughs> you know, there was an umpire that was just just destroyed us, absolutely destroyed us two or three times over the weekend, and I laid into him, and I was standing next to Fred, and they threw Fred out instead of me, and anyway. Sorry about that, Fred. Well, um, I just want to... Maybe people can kind of tell I'm not 100% for it. I, I still like the natural t- natural part of the game. I, I just want to throw a quote out yeah. at you and then a- kind of ask you something here. And maybe this is a non sequitur, but I'll say it anyway. So Tampa Bay Lightning head coach John Cooper, very successful, 
uh, said this in the past. He said, quote, The best thing about live sports is that there is drama with no scripts. Okay. So um, here's my question. With the possibility of this robo strike zone on the horizon at the major league level, I would think sooner rather than later, uh, do you think that we're starting to script the sport way too much and we're taking the human element out of the game? No, because somebody's still got to throw a ball over the plate. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I don't because it's still – it's not like there's a pitching machine on the mound throwing mm-hmm. and somebody's controlling the pitching machine. Okay, I want to throw a ball, you know, location six – 48 miles an hour, you know, EFAS or whatever. You know, it's still a human throwing, you know, throwing the ball. Give it 100 so years. I, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I get it. I get what you're saying. But I, I think what you're doing is you're setting boundaries in the field of play. That's what you're doing. Like, we've set boundaries, right? There's a foul line. Mm-hmm. That foul line is totally straight, mm-hmm. okay? And we have instant replay if a ball is really close. Mm-hmm. So essentially, to me, this is kind of setting a boundary within the strike zone. But again, that's me. I, and, and I think you're probably more in the majority of, hey, let's have the human element of the umpire. I really, like I do, I, I don't think I'm the norm of having a, a robo strike zone. Um, here's what I do know. When I went from college in, into even minor league baseball, right? I, I obviously never made it to the big leagues. Didn't even play the minor leagues that long. But when I got there, I was like, I'll never forget my first at bat. It was like, there was a ball like four inches off the plate, three, four inches off the plate outside. And I'm like, well, that was a strike. And the umpire's like, ball one. I was like, damn. Mm-hmm. If this was college two weeks ago, I'd be sitting 0 and 1 right now. Yeah. In a defensive mode. Now all of a sudden, I'm sitting 1 and 0. Yeah. And it was like the strike zone was completely different back then. You know, I think college strike zone's a little bit better now. But, mm-hmm. I mean, it used to be if you hit a catcher's mitt in college, it didn't matter. They could set up in the other batter's box. <laughs> you know, I mean, I remember we talked about Mark Pryor. He just dotted that the white line in the in the left-handed batter's box, like, all day long, and his catcher was out there. Maybe Bo Craig at the time or something. I'm trying to think of the catcher at SC. But, um, yeah, he's just dotting it. It's like, well, how am I supposed to hit that? Yeah. Well, it looked like a good pitch. He centered up the catcher. So, you know, I, I think just having good umpires makes the game more enjoyable. Maybe having robo umpires makes it even more enjoyable. Again, what am I? I'm a hitting coach, right? So you're not no a, biased, right? Okay. I'm not a pitching coach, and yeah. I'm not a catching coach. You ask those guys, they're like, "Oh, heck no!" Yeah, you know, we don't want a robo umpire. There's not many, not many strikes. I mean, Angel Hernandez, right? You know, he he was taking a nap a couple weeks ago, but not many people will miss a strike. Right, right like down the middle. Strike down yeah, the middle. Figure. <laughs> They're probably not going to call it a ball. So the easiest I think, strike you know, to call. <laughs> yeah, right. I think as a as as the robo upsco, I think that's going to be hitting people are going to be um, more of a proponent than you know yeah, somebody else. I, I, pitching, I, I, pitching I, agree. I agree with you there. Yeah. Um, well, coming up, we're going to talk about strategy, how it, how it could affect strategy. But we've reached and a lot more. But um, we've reached the midway point of the show. And we're going to take a little commercial break for your business, The Lab. Uh, and um, I got an email earlier this week. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to log on to thelabbcs.com and subscribe to the mailing list. I get these uh, emails every week. And there's fall pitching camps coming up September 19th to the, to the 20th. We're recording this today on the 12th. This episode will be out on the 14th. So there's still time to sign up with hands-on instructor and former Texas A&M Major League Baseball and World Series champion pitcher Alex Wilson. Left-handed pitcher, yes. He pitched in the World Series. If I'm not, Is he right-handed? He's right-handed, yeah. No way. He might still be well, Who am I thinking of? Who's left-handed? He was in the Tigers rotation years ago when they went to the World Series. I don't know. Okay. Well, Alex, does he listen to the show? Maybe. I'm sorry, Alex. Right-handed pitcher, Alex <laughs> Wilson. I knew. I know who he is. I do know who he is. I do have I'll some tell you what, baseball Alex knowledge. Alex is one heck of a uh, barbecue or two. Oh, that, he's, that, like he's, the, on... he's like the pit master. Well, he, you got to give me his email. I need to get some some tips. I mean, he puts out some nice. What stuff. We, I think that's his second uh, his second love. What's he do? Uh, rub or what's he? he do? Yeah, no, he's 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 like a he, he's a uh, he smokes briskets, turkey, uh, 
you know, ribs. I think ribs are too easy for him. Pork butt. Yeah, he turns out some really nice brisket. I, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I need to get his, uh, get his email. And yeah, I'll him. give it to you. Yeah, Willie's awesome. And, I mean, the experience that somebody like that has and, and, you know, the lessons that he does at the lab, you know, people just, they eat it up because you don't get that kind of experience all the time, you know, and somebody, and the good part is, you know, Alex went through a couple surgeries, right? Like he, he's, he's been through those, but, and, and so he does everything he can t- and, and from what he's learned to alleviate, you know, the issues that maybe come from overthrowing or, or improper technique or, um, you know, overuse of, of certain players at certain ages. So, yeah, the throwing camp or the pitching camp is going to be awesome um, for players. They, they're doing different sections for different age players. Lance Dobbins, another really good pitching guy. He's kind of our main dude at the lab, too. He, he's going to be out there helping out. And then Overflow will go to Matt Langwell. Matt, Matt's another ex. He pitched at Rice. He pitched for the Cleveland Indians for years. He's a big leaguer. Mm-hmm. Um, you're probably not going to find – three more knowledgeable experienced pitching guys in in one place you know really anywhere in the country yeah so be sure to log on to the lab bcs.com sign up right now again this is a basic skills camp for ages 9 to 12 uh, working on fundamentals of throwing pitching mechanics fielding your position pfps if you don't know what that is kids google it I'll put it into the computer. you will soon yeah uh, well, they'll teach you that, of course, at the lab. Uh, shoulder care, very very important, and conditioning as well. So a great opportunity for all young players to build their skills and um, work on their off-season goals as well. So log on to the lab, bcs.com again. Um, you got to sign up quickly because it's coming up uh, next week, September 19th to the 20th. Um, ages 9 to 12, 8 to 10 a.m., ages 13 to 16, 12 to 2 p.m., so back-to-back. Um, and it's a great price too, one hundred and fifty dollars. I think it's for that is is pretty damn good. So again, log on to the lab bcs dot com. And Alex uh, is a right handed pitcher. Sorry, Alex. And he's a good barbecuer. Now we know. Boy, we are we are just uh, we are all over the place on today's show. We are the ADD of podcasts today. <laughs> well. I'm sure there's something we can take for that. Anytime you uh, tell me, talk to me about grilling, I, I do get uh, very excited. Okay, uh, let's get back to uh, episode 21 here of uh, Robo, the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast, Robotic Strike Zones. Um, I, I want to ask you about how, let's just say for subject's sake, that it is implemented at the major league level, and it's implemented at the minor league level. All the bugs are out, and, okay, we've got our strike zone, just so, like we have our foul line set, and we have our ground rules set. How does this change um, the strategy? How does this cha- change the guy's approach? We talked about it um, on the player development side, a couple of, of, of player development episodes already in the archive, so check that out. We did one last week. How do you go about now with this new strike zone? Because there are teams that that plan for certain umpires that strategize to that umpire. Hitters do, hitting coaches and whatnot. So how does the whole player development and approach change? Yeah, I think it it changes. You just don't you just don't lean heavily on those tendencies. You know, okay. if you have a an umpire, you know that's uh, you know he's a he's a high ball umpire, right? So mm-hmm. who else knows he's a high ball umpire? Well, the pitcher. Well, what kind of pitcher are we facing? Well, he's a four seam guy with a higher spin rate. You know, he's got extra pine tar and rosin stuck to his hat and his forearm. Okay, well, he's probably going to try to spin that thing at the top of the strike zone. So, as a hitter, now I'm 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 moving my sights up. I'm thinking early in the count. I got to stay on top of something. I got to stay on top of something. I keep my hands up. Okay, I'm looking in that area. Um, you know, with umpires. You know, sometimes it's hey, this this guy gives he does he doesn't call balls inside. Yeah. Okay, so anything inside is going to be an eye wash. Mm-hmm. You know, they're just trying to move my eyes and go back outside because he gives two or three inches off the outside corner. Now I'm going to protect outside, keep my front shoulder down longer. I'm going to think the other way. You know, so on and so forth. So I think without that, now you just turn your tendencies towards the pitcher. Mm-hmm. You know, how does this guy typically throw me? But pitchers will have to change if pitchers aren't getting those pitches that are off the plate yeah. one way or another, they're going to have to make more adjustments, I would say, than the hitter's going to have to make adjustments. Okay, so maybe I mean, I'll... God forbid a pitcher had to throw a ball over the plate. Oh, yeah. 
and they may not get the strike call from Angel Hernandez. <laughs> so I, I'm I, 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 just to be clear here, maybe I'm overthinking how the strategy for a hitter would would change. Uh, they would. It, it, I'm, I guess I'm wondering if, yeah. if they're really going to be affected by this. I don't think so. Okay. I, I think so. They won't even notice uh, uh, in a way. No, they, they will because okay. I think with two strikes, you don't have to quote protect as much. Okay, that makes right? sense. Yeah. We're protecting 17 inches, not 21 inches. Okay, that's essentially you know the the changes a hitter hitter makes. And don't get me wrong, like pitching is totally not dominating the sport. I mean, their strikeouts are up, but I don't know how many guys have hit three home runs a game this year. Mm-hmm. It's got to be some kind of record through 30 games. I mean, I, every time I turn around, guys are hitting multi-home run games. I don't know if it's just because we got, you know, younger kids pitching, but there's something going on with the with the ball. Yeah. Um, there. I mean, fly balls are just kind of going a lot further, you know, than than they should. There's not a lot of balls that go over outfielders' heads and stay in the ballpark. So let me throw a scenario out at you, if I can. Mm-hmm. How does the robo strike zone for a hitter? And their approach, there's that word again. Uh, how does that affect when it's three balls, two strikes, runners at second and third, or, or bases loaded? Three balls, two strikes. And for those who don't know, strategy within the game always. Anytime you, it's acceptable to be called out on strikes when it's a close pitch on three balls, two strikes with runners in scoring position. There's a reason for that. And I'll, I, I know the reason, but I'll let you get into it a little bit more. How does that change now? The robo strike zone of change <laughs> that scenario because a lot Four of times you'll might see not be as aggressive on the that. players are not there might not well they might not even be they their strike zone will shrink even more now because yeah. it's almost like three it's three two runners in scoring position a lot of hitters well top notch hitters who make it to the big league level they their strike zone shrinks to almost like it's oo again mm-hmm. and. I think it situation to bed bases loaded that's different you know bases loaded they're gonna they're gonna shrink it runner uh, runners second and third first base open as a hitter you got to know your situation am I more of a threat than the guy on deck you know is it a left-handed pitcher and I'm a right-handed hitter the guy on deck's left-handed right yeah. my strike zone like he he's gonna give in like he's not gonna He's not going to, I'm sorry, he's not going to give in to me and throw me a fastball right here. If he walks me, he walks me, but he's going to try to get me out. Yeah. Um, maybe yeah. I'm, you know, it's righty on righty. The guy behind me is a lefty, and he's got two hits already today. They probably don't want to face him. Now, all of a sudden, I think I'm going to get a, a much better pitch to hit. So, as a hitter, we have to be aware of, you know, who's hitting behind us and as well as the game situations. Um Yes, I think that it puts a lot more pressure on a pitcher yeah. to know he has to throw a strike that's in it. You know, he's not going to be able to dot mm-hmm. three and two, yeah. right? He's going to have to throw to a third or a quarter of that plate. And as a hitter, that makes makes life a little bit easier for me. And yeah. maybe, you know, it would be, it'd be a cool experiment just to be like, okay, we got robo umpires. Hey, pitchers, don't change a thing. Mm-hmm. Let's see what happens. You know, maybe hitters still swing at that pitch that's a couple inches off the plate, but I don't think so. I think what you're going to see is hitters are going to be in more advantageous counts mm-hmm. if that happens. Yeah. Well, you so. know, instead of a 1 1 pitch being called that's borderline and then being 1 2, now they're going to be 2 1. They're going to be in the driver's seat. Yeah. That O O pitch will be crucial. Well, thanks for clearing that up. We are going to talk about um, certain counts and approaches to counts in a future episode. Our episode list is actually booked up, so probably in the new year. January, mm-hmm. which probably for some people can't come soon enough. Now, uh, moving on here, we're let's assume there's not going to be the robo strike zones at the little league level, high school, at uh, what do they call it when it's 12, 13, 14, whatever that is. The 12 view, 14 view. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're not going to see the robo strike zones, I don't think. Maybe we will some places, but I don't, overall, I don't think we will. Yeah. Do you feel that this will become the equivalent of aluminum bats to where people don't even notice anymore that kids use aluminum bats and then they go right into pro ball uh, using wood or into college ball where the aluminum bats best mirror in, this, in terms of the sweet spot um, the aluminum the wood bats yeah I don't know that's a that's a, a really thought out question from a from a guy that went to Villanova right like, no. is that where you went Mm-mm. Where'd you go? Seton Hall. Mm-hmm. 
Seton Hall Junior College, Seton Hall Prep. No. What? No. Seton Hall, right, Seton Hall Prep is in North Jersey. I grew up in <laughs> Southern New Jersey. No, I know. Where'd you go to college? LaSalle University. LaSalle, that's right. My dad had a LaSalle shirt. That's right. All right, sorry. Sorry, now the friendship's over, isn't it? No, that's okay. We call it Villanova. Is that French? Uh, I don't know. It's Catholic. <laughs> LaSalle, is that like Versailles? I don't know. What were we talking about? It's Catholic. I got ADD. That's French. It could be French. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Good well, question. I'll have to look it up. What were we later. talking about? Can we rewind what we were talking about? Yeah. You asked me. It was a good question, too. You said... <laughs> <laughs> because he said a good question from a guy who went to Villanova. <laughs> you're like, so we didn't really, we didn't really scratch the surface on your answer at all. all so right, I'll ask again. The... So uh, let me rewind here in my head. Is it, is it in your notes? Yes. So let's assume, blah, 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 that strike zones aren't going to be in, you know, Little League and blah, blah, blah. Will this be, will the robo zone? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Will it be. Is it going to go away? How, well, a normal strike, it's going to be, not normal, I guess, a human strike zone with human umpires at yeah. that level. Is that the equivalent of kids when they use yeah. aluminum bats and then move on where we don't even notice anymore at the college level? The sweet spot's smaller, so it's equivalent to an aluminum bat or as close as it can get. And then we guys moving to pro ball and you don't even notice anymore that, that, there's the disparity between aluminum and wood. Is that the yeah, way it's going to be it, with the robo strike zone? I, yeah, I think so. I, and I think everything takes time, right? I mean, uh, what was it? I'm trying to think when BB Core came out. Jeez, I don't know. 2000, mid 2000s, 2010. Was it that late? Mm-hmm. Maybe it was closer to 2010. But you know, the early 2000s, mid 2000s, like the bats got crazy in college, right? I mean, oh, they yeah. were composite. They're they slingshots. Yeah. I mean, it was you, people are hitting balls. I wish we had TrackMan back then, right? I mean, we'd probably see balls 125, 130 miles an hour, maybe. You know that are hit off the bat, and then all of a sudden you went from that directly to to pro ball, and it was like you didn't know who was a good player. Mm-hmm. You know, you really didn't know what was going on at that time. So it was very difficult for Major League Baseball to figure out, you know, what was what. You know, is this guy finding barrels or? Is he just a big, strong guy that, you know, whatever uses this, you know, six-inch sweet spot? So I think now it's become, you know, the BB cores becomes normal. If you can hit in college, you know, you're, you're going to be able to hit the pros. Yeah. Um, I should say that. But if you if you can hit it, a, you know, if you can perform against top-level talent, it's good. Cape Cod obviously makes it. But you still go to the Cape Cod League, right? And guys don't hit like they hit in college with their aluminum bat. Yeah. Um, you know, I see an exit velocity of you know, within one or two miles an hour between a good BB core bat and a good wood bat. So they're very similar in terms of max exit velocity. The difference is the sweet spot is, you know, probably another inch to two inches larger on the metal bat. So that's where you see the difference is if you miss by two inches on a wood bat, you're seeing a drop in exit velocity like, you know, 15 miles an hour. With the aluminum bat, you might be seeing an exit velocity of 8 to 10 miles an hour. Right. So, you know, that's kind of the difference we see between that. But it's different than, you know, how it used to be where it was 40 miles an hour different. You know, it, it still stayed true. So, yeah, I think people will get used to it like anything else. Everybody – Adapts. I'm trying to think. I mean, think about instant replay, right? It was so silly in the in the NFL when it first came out, and now it's like every single play is under review, and we're just yeah, we've gone the other way, quite it. frankly. Which we, is, it's too much, right? Too much, yeah. yeah. It's not as much in college, which is good. It, it takes me back yeah. to a time, a quote. I don't know the exact quote, um, but um, I'll paraphrase it here. Back when I was in, in high school, young Jim would wake up Saturday morning, do some homework, <laughs> quote unquote. And right. um, turn on his PlayStation 2, uh, play a little bit of Madden franchise mode. I was the uh, the GM. I didn't make many good decisions. I like to uh, buy players <laughs> rather than draft and develop. And then I would uh, eat breakfast. And during breakfast, what I would do is I would there was this magazine that came once a month, and it was uh, the with all the equ- baseball equipment in it, new equipment. And had some bats, some BB Corp. No, maybe not BB Corp. Um, I don't know. Uh, those aluminum bats had the big sweet spot. And I remember Pat yeah. Murphy, who was the head coach at the time at Arizona State, he was quoted yeah. as saying that the bats are like a slingshot. They they just, I mean, balls just absolutely are just go a million miles, you know, in, in distance. 
And um, I, I remember that. Um, and I remember the adjustment to how the, the to the to the bats to the, co- the college players had to go through uh, when yeah. the sweet spot was a little bit smaller. So there is that adjustment period, and I think there will be that little adjustment period um, when the robo zones do come into play at the collegiate level. And I think the adjustment comes from the pitchers. Yeah, yeah. I, I really don't think the the hitters are going to complain about much except for that ball that clips the front of the strike zone Mm -hmm. you know and that those are guys that that, where they set up they're set up in the back of the box yeah right as where we should and that ball's clipping the that that strike zone is over the plate Mm -hmm. itself right it's not to the hitter and where the hitter's standing it's likely right above where home plate is Mm -hmm. so where you position yourself to home plate matters so you know that curveball hits the very front of home plate at the knees but by the time the catcher it reaches the catcher it's in the dirt because yeah. the guy's in the back of the box and the catcher has to be behind the hitter so he doesn't get hit that's the issues that that are going to arise for hitter but for the most part it's going to be a pitcher adjustment so ted williams always said get a good pitch to hit i've read the science of hitting his book uh, you know, hundreds of times here and i'm sure you have as well mm-hmm. well you don't you didn't really need to uh, you kind of talked to him personally and you have a Certificate and a letter of recommendation. So really, don't need to read the book. But nevertheless, um, he said by successfully doing that, getting a good pitch to hit, you need to understand the strike zone. So I'll ask you this here to kind of uh, round about the show before we get to our listener question: What should the strike zone be, in your opinion? In other words, with the robo zone, what should the dimensions of this strike zone be going forward? without constantly having to throw shit at the wall and hope it sticks and trying to determine an actual strike zone. We need to have a determination with what it is. What do you think it should be? Well, I think it's 17 inches wide. I think that's the big thing. You know, I, I think it's 17 inches wide. That's, you know, when uh, Doubleday decided to create, I don't know if it's in his original <laughs> plan or not, but, you know, 17 inches wide, that's that's home plate. I think ideally you take into consideration the player – um, you know, when they're standing there, you know, what their strike zone is. And that's going to be very, very difficult, right? You have mm-hmm. tall guys that stand very upright in their stance, mm-hmm. yep. and you have guys that kind of squat down. But the strike zone really occurs after the player is swinging, right? So the umpire is calling that pitch when they're, you know, in their athletic position. So how do you determine what that athletic position is and where the knees are? So that's very difficult. I think they're going to have to come out with a an absolute cut and dry average of the strike zone, mm-hmm. um, which will probably benefit taller guys more than shorter guys, right? Because that strike zone can't be as tall on the the shorter guys. Yeah, and they're going to have to just just kind of stick with it. Um, and maybe they do. Maybe they look at games over. You know, the his not the history, but the, you know, maybe the um, God, what's the word I'm thinking of? The track record of umpires. Right, you know, what is the highest strike guys are calling in Major League Baseball on average? You know, yeah. from all the different umpires. Okay, this is and and it's how high off the ground is that? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, this is and that's where they set the parameter. Okay, what does a low strike look like that crosses kind of the bottom of the knees? Yeah. You know, you know what is that average between all the different umpires that they're calling? Boom, and then we set our top. So side to side, east and west. Boom, we know what that is. Seventeen inches. The height is going to have to be um, an exact number. I don't think they're going to have time to program in, you know, Jose Altuve, you know, versus, <laughs> um, you know, Joey Gallo or yeah. something when they go in there. I, I don't think that's possible. And I think it has to be over home plate and, and not be de- determined by where the player is in the box. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's another because I think too. that's yeah. gonna that's gonna be a problem because if you move a guy way back in the box, those pitches might not cross him at the same spot as somebody that's in the middle of the box. Right. So I think it has to be over home plate itself, and then hitters. Maybe there's your adjustment, right? Mm-hmm. There's your adjustment. Hitters that are really far back in the box, it might be a little different. So Ted Williams said, "Look, you want to make contact out in front of your front foot." Your front, and you want to make contact in fair territory. It's like bunting in fair territory, right? You have the angles are better. You know, from the corner of home plate, if you're making contact behind the corners of home plate where the field lines are, then essentially you're shrinking your your field of play. Mm-hmm. If
if you make contact out in front of home plate, you're using the entire you know uh, angle of of the field. So when you make contact, you want to make contact out in front of your front foot because yep. that's where your barrel maximizes its speed. And you also want to make contact in fair territory. What does that mean? This is why I set my players up this way. We want to have our front foot our front foot at about the front of home plate. Okay, so that gives us kind of the the best scenario where we're not too far. You know, we're not in the middle of the box. We're still in the back of the box, but maybe we're you know we're not too far back. So I think those kind of things might be a little bit more important to players if there is to hitters if there is a robo strike zone. It's like okay, we gotta have an idea of where that strike zone is. Yeah, you know, and, and I mean, you got listen, you got guys. That's that's tough because how about a guy like Hater who's delivering the ball from like four feet, five feet from the the arm side of the rubber yeah so his ball is not you know nobody releases the ball from the middle of the mound right so his ball is cutting across does it cut across and get the back of that strike zone yeah or does it you know what i mean like where does even though the catcher so say he's throwing to a right-handed hitter and he's throwing all the way across home plate and he catches that front corner well maybe by catching that front corner that ball almost hits the hitter yeah right like Who's going to piss and moan about it? Well, here it is on the screen. Yeah. There it is. So I, I think what it'll do is it'll make pitchers get more creative, too. Pitchers are smart. And you know what? People are smart. And people always find a way to take advantage of the situation, right? And I think if you make a robo, you know, we're talking about the, the actually, the more I'm talking about it, I'm like, pitchers can totally start to manipulate this zone by where they release the ball. You're going to see a lot of guys that are throwing more, you know, maybe not as much. Like right now, it's all spin rate, right? Mm -hmm. Fastballs with life. Now, all of a sudden, I think you're going to see guys move to different sides of the rubber. They're going to try to throw from different arm slots to try to, you know, catch a piece of that because it might not look like a strike when the catcher catches it, but maybe it just catches a piece of that, you know, Mm -hmm. virtual strike zone. So, okay, so so it it shouldn't have where the hitter's standing, that should never determine the. Where the strike? I think it's going to be like cricket, right? You hit the stick, it, it's a strike. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It goes through a certain area, yeah, a certain field. You know, if I'm thinking of just that that box on Major League, you know, Network or whatever. I'm I'm thinking about ESPN, ESPN yeah, so yeah. Sunday Night Baseball, yeah. right? Like, I'm thinking about that box and how sometimes it, you know, it's blue and then it catches red, right? It just gets a little bit of that strike zone. That's what I'm envisioning. Yeah. the robo strike zone being you know you catch a piece it's kind of like tennis right yeah if you catch a piece of that white line it's in mm-hmm. if you catch a piece of this strike zone it's in yeah well i think it, oh, you brought up an inter- interesting point too somebody like a patrick corbin who has that loopy type slider with very good shape mm-hmm. to it but it is very loopy a lot of times that that pitch will catch the back of the robotic three-dimensional mm-hmm. zone so you have to make that that back part uh, it just can't be the front part where he, yeah. the pitch just catches that part uh, of the strike right. zone. It has to be the the back. The back has to be in play as well. It does, and that's why you know you see balls. You know, I mean, you see weird calls sometimes with those mm-hmm. it, because of that. It's yeah. you know, home plate. It's over home plate, right? That's what the rule book says. Yeah, pitch over home plate. Well, home plate isn't you know, two inches deep. Right. Right? Yeah. You know, it's 15, or I don't know how deep it is, 14. Yeah. Hey, question for you. Are you wearing your mask? I know it's, it's with some people anyway. It might not be the most popular thing. But if you don't have a mask and you need to wear it around to certain places, I live in Florida, and while my state is mostly opened up, for pretty much everything, we still have to wear masks inside of convenience stores and restaurants, Super Target, which I went to the other day, Publix, where I go my, do my food shopping, whatever. I just want to let everybody know that the Gator Mask shipment is here. You know what that is? Well, that's okay. You can find out. Log on to DunningBlueJays.com and get your Toronto Blue Jays face mask. That Gator Mask, it's hard to kind of describe, but I'll do my best. It's actually what the players wear. Kevin Biggio was wearing it. In fact, last week, second baseman for the Toronto Blue Jays, it is there for protection, obviously. It's the Gator Mask, so log on to DunningBlueJays.com. It's available online or in-store for those who are here in Florida. You can schedule your shopping appointment by checking out the Toronto Blue Jays Twitter page, 
the Dunning Blue Jays Twitter page and DunningBlueJays.com, or you can buy online by logging on to DunningBlueJays.com, TorontoBlueJays.com, and clicking on the J Shop. All right, well, good stuff this week. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. Check out our YouTube page, um, the Lab Epstein Hitting YouTube page for archived episodes. There was one that was uh, just premiered on Saturday today, Saturday morning, every every Saturday morning, in fact, we have archived episodes that premiere. Uh, follow us on social media, at Jim Tara, at Epstein Hitting, and, of course, uh, email us your questions at uh, JimboPodcast21 at uh, Jimbo uh, Jimbo Podcast 21 at gmail.com again Jimbo Podcast 21 at uh, gmail.com one more question I want to ask by the way is this something RoboZones is this something you would have advocated four years ago probably okay because pitching has gotten really good in the last ten years yeah okay so it was something you always sort of were for it is I'm not a fan of it you know cheating Okay. Well, well. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the suntan lotion and rosin. Okay, we'll leave it there. <laughs> we'll leave it there. But you know what? I'm also not a fan of you know juice baseball. So I see it from both sides, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Gosh, all a guy has to do is hit the ball in the air, and it's going to go out of the park. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm not, I don't think that's that's fair either. But I also I've seen pitches this year that I mean that dude for the Dodgers, crazy red haired guy Dustin May like, May yeah uh-huh. if I had to face that guy like I wouldn't even wake up the next day yeah. I'd be like ah there's no way I want to hit against that guy yeah. like he's throwing he's like he must have like seven fingers or something well I know his fingers I are mean, very long I know that I, I mean I, I've never seen a ball do that before it's yeah. crazy so same anyway thing with Blake Trinan too of the athletics yeah same yeah. thing it's not so yeah I mean I, cutter. Yeah, I'm not saying that he doctors up anything but you know um, and, and and then when you talk to pitchers about it, they're like, well, you know, what do you want me throwing a ball that's slick? We use a new ball every every batter, yeah, pretty much, right? So now I got a slick ball. What if I lose control over it? You know what I mean? I just so hope that I'm the like, robo zones don't go too far, like like yeah. we did in the steroid era where guys were hitting home runs or you know, right off the end of the bat, and pitchers were like, well, how we compete with this? I don't I don't right. want it to go too far I guess some of that is happening now though it's true I mean there's some really weak opposite field home runs that are going out of the park yeah Bryce Harper so. broke his bat years ago and hit a home run at City Field yeah how that happened I'll never know yeah sometimes you just get a you can barrel something and that bat had a little fracture in it or it's see true. how I make excuses for hitters that's all true too. okay fair enough all right let's get to our <laughs> listener question this comes to us from Bill Sent to us via Jimbo Podcast 21 at gmail.com. It's a long one. He says, Jim, to put my questions in some sort of context, I speak from a degree of experience with hitting instruction, past and present. In 1968, I attended Ted Williams Baseball Camp in Lakeville, Massachusetts as a teenager. Ted was our coach for two weeks while we were there, worked with us every day. Um, he also, Bill, said he spent a weekend at a clinic that Charlie Lau Sr. was a featured speaker. Um, it was a Q&A type thing. He said, Lau, Lau was a charmer. You could speak to this. Williams, less so. <laughs> I've, <laughs> Definitely. I've, I've, I've heard. Uh, anyway, he, also, he said, Bill also said uh, he attended a clinic at which Mike Epstein spoke, your father. And he, spe- he said, my experience with all three was educational, to say the least. And uh, he went on to ask, or at least state, in this email, he says, first, my statement about um, Canseco Ramirez A-Rod was misinterpreted. I don't remember what it is. Um, I didn't say they worked with Craig Wallenbrock, but that their hitting exploits were there for all of us to see. Okay, within the time frame of Jared Diamond's story of various hitting instructors in Swing Kings, and those exploits were well before the revolution that Diamond was talking about in his book. Okay. Uh, whether he wants the credit or not, I believe that Mike Epstein started the revolution, at least as far as Diamond's account. Uh, Mike put the science in Ted Williams' The Science of Hitting with concepts like torque, angular velocity, ground force, and others. Um, uh, again, I'm, I'm trying to skim through it here. It's a long email. 
Um, he went on to say Diamond should have credited Mike for the contributions. We determined that already. Okay, as for Dusty Baker, speaking from a high school coach's experience, his book and video series, You Can Teach Hitting, uh, did much more harm than good. The arguments I had with parents and kids who bought into the squish the bug and swing down approach because they bought Baker's book or were taught... Uh, my instructors who did were counterproductive to say the least. I believe the swing down approach stems from Baker's book. By the way, Baker, Dusty Baker didn't squish the bug or swing down, batting behind Hank Aaron in the Braves lineup. One last thing, Rich Gedman batted left handed. I don't Yes. Okay. And I that was the part I looked up and I'm like, Oh man, right. I totally thought he was a right hand. Right. Well Bill, you got but us. I you got getty. us there. I Bill. looked up the pictures of him, he has glasses, totally getty. Yeah. All right, you got us there. Congrats. Yeah. Um, and ep, ep, early in the episode got me on Alex Wilson. So I guess we all get well, There we go. Yeah, no, um, and he's right about that. that you know, so, yeah, I don't know where Bill's going with this. I'm sorry, Bill. Thanks for the email, but yeah. I'll let you take it. I really don't know. Yeah, no, I about. thought he had a ton of good information in there, you know, especially with, you know, the Dusty Baker thing. And it, it was, you know, it's it's easy. My, my dad always used to make the comment. <laughs> mm-hmm. My wife could say swing down and squish the bug. Like that's what that that was like one of his favorite quotes when he was teaching. You know, he'd ask the kid, "What have you been taught?" Well, I've been taught to swing down and squish the bug, and he'd say, "Well, my wife could say swing down and squish the bug," <laughs> and it, it is. It's just an easy thing, easy thing to say without explaining anything. And you know what? It probably helped a lot of little little guys out there that you know never moved their 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 backside. So. Um, yeah, I don't think it was a. I don't think it's it's. It, well, it's definitely not what Dusty Baker did. But I, I don't know. I've I've heard s- hundreds of of professional players say I, I think about swinging down. And like I said, sometimes we tell our players to swing down if they're doing something where they're collapsing their backside, right? And they're dumping their barrel and they're swinging up too much. Like sometimes that's a good cue. But to actually have them do it, that's different. And that was you know the title of my dad's video you know do we teach what we really see right you know that was it like do we really see people squish the bug like here's a video of like a hundred players and they're not doing that you know and here's i mean hank aaron for crying out loud watching hank aaron hit that guy's back foot was never on the ground yeah and he's pretty good so you know it it is you know do we see people swing down no Mm -hmm. but do maybe we feel like we're swinging down you know there's players all the time that are saying i I, i'm trying to swing down you know i'm trying to chop i'm trying to do this and that are they actually doing it no so will that cue work for another player maybe will it work for every player no and that's why you treat hitters individually based on what they're doing and what their feels are yeah well well said good stuff this week again uh if you have any questions um Shoot us an email or reach out to us on social media. Jimbo Podcast twenty one at gmail dot com. Next week we go back to our mechanical breakdown series volume trace, volume three. And we'll be doing Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Your Very guy. Good. Your guy. You love him. You love his swing. Not my guy, it's your guy. You, I haven't you seen love his swing though. Year. I do love his swing. I, I I don't even know what kind of. I, I unfortunately I haven't watched very much baseball. Enough baseball. You know, I've been working a lot, so mm-hmm. I'll have to brush up and 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 check out his stats and get some updated video and and see what see if he's made any changes. Because I know his swing like the back of my hand from the last couple of years, but mm-hmm. I really haven't you know seen any of his live stuff this year. So that'll be fun to see for me. Yeah. So Something that's, new to learn. That is next week. Be sure to like and subscribe. New episodes every Monday at nine a.m. We are out of time. Thank you for listening, and we will talk to you next week. See you later.